say there is truly something about the name Jesus. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Beautiful, beautiful. Songs of Zion song before I got up here. Thank you all so much. But good morning, everyone. As always, it is an honor and a privilege to stand before you this day. First and foremost, I want to thank my pastor for another opportunity uh, to bring the word to God's people. If you will, at this moment, I won't belabor the time. If you will, follow me to Jonah 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. And then I'm going to jump to verse 10. But then I'm going to jump over to verse 2, <laughs> chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 1 and 10. And so Jonah is not an unfamiliar text. We learn about Jonah in the belly of a fish at a very, very young age. But I believe that God has given me a fresh perspective and insight that will continue to help us grow in our day-to-day -day Christian walk. And so here we are in Jonah 1. I said 10, but I meant 1 through 3 and then verse 17, I'm sorry. And then in Jonah 2 is verses 1 and 10. So, and it reads, Jonah 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3 says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so now we're going to go over to Jonah 2. And we're going to read verses 1 and 10. Verse 1 says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And then verse 10 says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The word of God for the people of God. And so this morning I want to talk to you about the title, the title of my sermon is going to be, A Believer in the Belly. A Believer in the Belly. Let us pray. Father God, there is no one like you. God, as your word is brought forth, it is my prayer that this moment be a space created to pre permeate our thoughts, our excuses and our distractions. Father, I turn myself over to you and I say quite literally, have thine own way. I cannot do this without you. As a matter of fact, I won't do this without you. And it is my prayer that for those that can hear and even see me, Lord, that they are able to feel your presence. And so, God, we turn this moment over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. A, be a believer in the belly. One of the most amazing times in my life as a parent was taking my sons to their first day of kindergarten. 
As you walk into a kindergarten teacher's classroom and jail, you, you see bright colors of ABCs and, and one, two, threes. And then they have these charts that teach you your colors. And they have these specific educational quotes like learning is fun and hand in hand together we can. But there is one chart that is always in the front of the classroom, right next to the chalkboard. I have always seen this chart. It's been white with black bold letters that's read classroom rules. And as you skim down the list of the main rules that kindergarten teachers teach each and every day, day in and day out, one of the main things on the classroom instructions is that you have to follow directions. In our word today, we meet a man by the name of Jonah. We are meeting him at a time when God has just given him specific directions to follow. God has told Jonah to head to the district of Columbia, I meant Nineveh, and preach against it. You see, Jonah was a prophet. He knew right from wrong, but yet, instead of following God's instructions, he decided to do the opposite. As I thought about Jonah, it seems like he hated the name Nineveh. Like perhaps the way someone hates thinking about the person who may have abused them or that spouse who left them or that offender who attacked them. Whatever it was about the city of Nineveh, Jonah did not want to have a part of that place. And so not doing what the Lord had told him to do, Jonah decided he deserved a vacation on the Mediterranean coast and he headed to Tarsha as he was headed by way of Joppa. As I studied this text, I realized that we are no different than Jonah. You see, at times in our lives, when God tells us to do something that doesn't quite make sense to us, we simply don't want to do it. We like to pick and choose what we do. We want to be in control. And Burger King got us all messed up, always thinking we can have it our way. But have you ever stopped and asked yourself, when has what God asked ever made sense? Part the Red Sea, Moses. Kill your son, Abraham. David, little shepherd boy, go slay that giant. None of what I just said makes sense. And somehow I am always surprised when God asks me to do something that just doesn't make sense as if I an exception in all of history. But just like Jonah, we have plenty of reasons why we'd rather head to Joppa first. After all, the city of Joppa means beauty. And so who isn't ready at this moment to go down to Joppa and travel somewhere that's full of beauty? Curse you, COVID-19. Yet and still, we have some reasons why we don't want to do what God tells us to do. The first reason is that we always like to run from God. If you think about it, we are always running. We run home, we run to the store, we run for the week, we run away for the weekend, we run to the bathroom, we run an idea by somebody, we even run with the wrong crowd and often we are on the run spiritually. Jonah was a man who possessed a strong patriotic spirit and enjoyed prophesying the positive messages God had given to him. But the time had come, the time had come for Jonah to tell somebody some bad news. And Jonah just was not up to the task. Thus, he felt he needed to run. And just like Jonah, we run because we are scared, we're prideful, we're rebellious, and because we've been hurt. We run because we simply believe God's presence is not what's best for us. But the second reason is because as Christians, we can be some ratchet people. And for my young folk, I'm not talking Megan the Stallion, classy, 
sassy, bougie, ratchet. No, that's not what's happening. I'm talking about the rude, laughing grace, just plain, low down ratchet. But outside of what's going on in our world today, we Christians got some growing to do. We got some changes to make. We don't always look and act like a Christian unit. You know, sometimes my heart truly goes out to some of our pastors. I watch some pastors profusely work behind the scenes, watching them work overtime, and some of us can't even keep a brother or sister encouraged because too many of us would rather complain about what they aren't doing than what they are doing. As Christians, our attitude is atrocious. Our minds are mischievous. Our hearts are horrendous. Our perfectness is pentamerous, and our thoughts are treacherous. I'm telling you, we often need to check ourselves because we are some ratchet people. My third reason is because we are not rational in our thinking. You see, Jonah, he didn't think things through. He just acted. We sometimes do the same thing, but that's the humanistic side of us. You see, our minds are the root of all of our human actions. It is via our minds that our affections are stirred. It is in the mind that directs the will. It is in our minds that conceive and direct every action of our lives. You know, one of the greatest biblical accounts in the Bible of irrational thinking is the story of David and Bathsheba. You know, the story of David is when he was at home, he should have been going with his army, but he decided to stay home and chill. And so David walks out on the balcony, and as he looks down, he sees this beautiful woman bathing. Now, at that moment, David should have walked right back in the house and just used his imagination. But no, David said, I want her. I So he committed adultery, plotted, and then had her husband killed. And as a consequence, God took his child. Why do we put ourselves in the position to function as God when our God-like qualities are severely limited? We can't see into the future. We don't have all power. We can't fathom the concept of infinity. We even struggle at times to remember what we have at lunch on the same day. And yet we keep trying to step into the God role and take charge of our lives, which always turns out to be the wrong choice. And just like the results of David's disobedience, God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. We can all relate again to Jonah. Well, some of us can because others are in the process of trying to figure out how they ended up in a belly situation in the first place, as if it is no fault of their own. But you see, the thing is, God doesn't let you get away from your assignment. I know I'm speaking from experience. God will chase you down, and now that Jonah is in a belly situation, Jonah has no choice but to face God. He's in the depths of the ocean, and he can't go anywhere. And when you have been resisting and running and hiding from God, he will cause an interruption that will put your life on hold. Have you ever been brought to a place like that? Because of your actions, your life began to spiral. And once you were in a belly situation, all you could do was sit still and pray and think, pray to God that you make it out some way, somehow. Maybe like Jonah, you were brought to a place where you had to face God in a way you were avoiding. Or maybe you had a time of illness that you had to endure. Or maybe you found yourself in a season where things were stripped down or someone was stripped away. We all have our belly situations. And while we are there, God causes some things to happen. You know, the first thing he causes is he causes you to reflect. You know, when Jonah was sitting in the belly, probably with some seaweed wrapped around his neck, all he could do was begin to reflect as to how he ended up there in the first place. We are no different. 
we start saying, I should have done this, or I should have done that, or I should have handled it this way. We don't think about the cost or the loss or regret or the pain or the disaster, but in the midst of our belly experience, when our hands are tied or our bodies are paralyzed or our lips can't even speak, we begin to reflect with allows our brains to pause amidst the chaos. You see, in our place of paralyzation, we begin to talk to God and we begin to praise God. And at that moment, we become the model Christian. Lord, get, please get me out of this situation. I'll go to Nineveh. You see, God shakes our lives to the very core to give us a wake up call. The deaths of Kobe and Chadwick and even this pandemic is all making us reflect and realize we got to do things in this new atmosphere differently because whether you realize it or not, life is short. The second thing God causes you to do while you're in your belly situation is he causes you to raise up a prayer. In his belly situation moment, Jonah raised up a Thanksgiving prayer. You know, sometimes it takes something as dire and dramatic as getting caught in a fish's belly to bring the gravity of our decisions to light. We choose sin over savior. We choose self over surrender. And sometimes we forget how important and powerful prayer is. God knows no distance and neither does our prayers. If we call upon God, our circumstances can change. And more importantly, we can also. Because our prayer life is shaped by our faith, our personal experience, and our relationship with God. At every turn in our life, our prayer experience can wither, it can stagnate, or it can crawl, cause us to grow due to our circumstances. But no matter where we find ourselves, we can always pray. Now, the last thing that God will allow to happen to you is that he will restore you. You know, when something is restored, it is always better than it was to begin with. You know, God delivers us even when we resist his guidance in our lives. You know, God delivers us even in this moment that we are trying to go against him. In Zechariah, it says, even today, I will restore double to you. I've often heard Minister Yancey say, he'll give you double for your trouble. As you can see in the text, after Jonah raised up a prayer, God restored him and vomited him up out of his situation. Hmm, you see, vomit means to regurgitate, to eject, to throw up or spew out with a force or violence. As I read that God vomited Jonah out of his belly situation again, it hit home with me and made me realize every now and then you got to thank God for vomiting you up out of your situation. You got to say thank God for vomiting me out of that bad marriage. You got to say thank God for vomiting me out of that financial situation. You got to say thank God for vomiting me out of that stressful job. You got to say thank God for vomiting me out of my illness and my health issues. And sometimes you just got to thank God for vomiting you up out of your crazy situation. You see, my boy Daniel, he was in a belly situation until God came and vomited him up outside the fiery furnace. You know, my main man Paul was in a belly situation until God vomited him out of being a believer. You know, my cousin Moses and the Israelites was in a belly situation until God vomited them out of the hands of Pharaoh. And if you look back over your life, you ought to stand up and thank God for sending you out of that belly situation. You know, as I finished my sermon, I said, Reverend Grant, thank you for allowing me and you to get another one in the books. And he said to me, your sermon ain't finished yet. He said to me, if you gonna finish your sermon, you got to bring it on home.
room. I sat there for a minute and I was a little bit confused and I finally came to my senses and he finally said to me, and I know another man who was in a belly situation. They said he stood before a kangaroo court. They said he was brought up on some trumped up charges and because Amen. Amen. 